So we are going to start with the session number four of this week number two. We are going to end this uh, second week and we are going to have just two more weeks to end this course. So we are in the middle of the course. So we are going to uh, continue with the topic that we were developing yesterday was that it was a synonym for adjectives and we were uh, seeing a list of adjectives that we can use with the different words that we also can use to express that feeling. So now we are going to continue with that word. So in this case, we are going to have um, a vocabulary and examples of uh, adjectives uh, or uh, words that we can use um, despite of the main adjective. And also we are going to create some uh, examples of those uh, vocabulary that we are going to develop. And also we are going to talk about another topic, but it's, um, we are going to have like um, a couple of minutes for one topic and a couple of minutes for the other topic. So, um, Remember that you need to complete the section number one, two, and three for this week and also the midterm. So you need to work on the platform because um, it is necessary to complete that section um, in this week. So please work on the platform and complete the exercises that you have there. So we are going to begin and we are going to share this a document or the screen in which we are going to see the documents that we were uh, working these two weeks. So we have here the last part of uh, the examples that we were using or the words that we were using uh, for the vocabulary that we have. So now we are going to talk about vocabulary plus examples of those uh, words or those adjectives. So in this case, we are going to create a list of important synonyms that you can use to describe things, feelings, or people. So in this case, these words that we are going to use, um, we can use it to describe things, also feelings, and also people. So we have the first uh, word that we are going to use that is angry. Angry plus mad. In that case, we are going to use the uh, synonym of angry that is mad. We have angry. And we have man. And we have the example. Here, we have the example for this one. And it says, her behavior really made me angry. Su comportamiento realmente me hizo sentirme enojado o enojada. He's always been mad about kids.
And we are going to mark the words that we are using. Angry and mad. Then we have awful and terrible. And we have our examples. And it says, the weather last summer was awful. And then it says, that's a terrible thing to say. So we have the two examples using those words. Then we have another one that is big and large. And we have the examples. And we have here the first one and it says, it is the world's biggest computer company. We can use the superlative of comparative of the adjectives. There is no nothing wrong with using those words, but in that case, we are using the adjective. So in that case, we are going to mark the adjective. And the second one, it says, but CL is the world's largest producer of coffee. Then we have another one that is brave or courageous. But I'm going to move this one to the next page. And we have the example. And it says, I wasn't brave enough to tell her what I thought of Then we have cold and chilly. The examples that we have are today it is very cold.
And then we have I was feeling chilly. Then we have dear and expensive. And we have the examples. Everything so dear now, isn't it? And the second one, I can offer it, it is too expensive. Then we have delicious and yummy. This dish is delicious with cream. These biscuits are yummy. We have different and diverse. And we have the examples. They are sold in many different colors. And the next example, it says, my interests are very diverse. So what is the, the point of seeing these examples? So in this case, we're going to see uh, two different words that has almost the same meaning. So we're 
that case we are seeing like two words and two different um, sentences in which we can see the use of those words. For example, in this one that is different and diverse, we're um, talking about uh, um, that we have like many options. Uh, so in that case, uh, we have something different or we have something diverse because we have many, many options to choose. In that case, in the first example, it says there are so in many different colors. So in that case, we are saying that we have different options or a lot of options in which we can um, choose. And in the second one, it says, my interests are very diverse. So in that case, it's saying that I have a lot of things that I like. Así que para estos ejemplos, estamos utilizando dos palabras. El, um, we can say the main adjective and uh, the uh, synonym. Estamos utilizando un adjetivo y un sinónimo donde podemos eh, nosotros decir o utilizar para diferentes eh, tipos de oraciones, pero que tengan un significado parecido. So in that case, we have two options to use um, when we are using this kind of words. But uh, the main purpose of using uh, synonyms is to make the uh, conversation mm, we can say kind of interesting because we are going to use different words and we are not going to repeat the same word many times. Nos ayuda esto de los sinónimos para tener una gama de opciones a la hora de hacer o tener una conversación porque no vamos a utilizar siempre el mismo adjetivo sino que vamos a tener Diferentes adjetivos que podemos utilizar. Then we have another one that is uh, difficult or hard. And we have the two examples. We have the number one and it says, your writing is really difficult to read. And in the second one, it says, uh, it was one of the hardest things I ever did. So I was saying that it's not like uh, something complicated to use the superlative or the comparative of the adjectives. In that case, it is, it is not necessary to uh, not use that part of the adjective because we have the root of that uh, superlative or comparative adjective that is the same that we are using for the synonym. Así que no importa si vamos a utilizar un adjetivo en superlativo o comparativo, nosotros podemos seguir utilizándolo porque eh, como la raíz de ese adjetivo es la palabra que estamos usando con su sinónimo. Then we have easy and simple. We are just uh, going to write it. a couple of examples more and then we are going to change the topic. Easy and simple. And it says, it is easy for you to tell me to keep calm, but you are not in my position.
And we have the second one that is said, the answer is really quite simple. Then we have enormous and huge. And we have two examples for this. And we have the first one that it says, the problems facing the president are enormous. And the second one, he gazed up at her with huge brown eyes. Teacher, I have a question. And uh -huh. if you use uh if you say the problems facing the person are huge huge is a mistake no or is correct it's correct you can you can use both in this case we are saying that we have a synonym so if you are not going to use enormous or you are not going to use huge you can use big you can use a um, another synonym that you have for that word. So in that case, it is not a mistake. You can use a, a different word for that uh, expression. So that's okay if you can use another word for that uh, sentence. Thank you. And we have the last one. We are going to have uh, the last one example for this uh, topic. We are going to have a uh, different topic uh, that we are going to develop here in this session. So in this case, we have the last one that is false or untrue. And we have the two examples. He used a false name to get the job. And then we have the second one that it, that it says. These accusations are totally untrue. So in this case, it's also the same because in that case, you can use uh, for the second one, these accusations are false, for example are uh, not true, untrue, or something like that that you can use to talk about that situation. So, we were talking about the adjectives and uh, the synonyms, and if you can uh, search for the topic, you are going to find a lot of examples that you can use um, despite of the main adjective. Sí, eh, encontramos nosotros, ¿verdad? Eh, una larga lista de adjetivos con sus sinónimos y obviamente también vamos a encontrar ejemplos que nos ayuden a usar diferentes eh, adjetivos, no siempre los mismos que nosotros ya conocemos. Hay muchas palabras que nosotros podemos utilizar y que 
sean del mismo significado, que le demos el mismo significado a la oración, pero que nos ayude a variar, a tener una, eh, un grupo diferente de palabras que podemos estar utilizando y no siempre las mismas. Por eso es necesario que veamos este tipo de vocabularios para que vayamos agregando ¿verdad? palabras a lo que nosotros ya conocemos y podemos eh, variar a la hora de hacer un speech. So, we are going to change the topic and we are going to talk about the relative clauses. So, that is the topic that we are going to have for this session too. So, in this case, we are going to talk about relative clauses. And I'm going to change the page. So, the first thing that we need to know is, what is a relative clause? That is the question, and we have the answer. And it says, a relative clause is one kind of dependent clause. It has a subject and verb that can stand alone as a sentence. It is sometimes called an adjective clause because it functions like an adjective. It gives more information about a noun. A relative clause always begins with a relative pronoun which substitutes for a noun, a noun phrase, or a pronoun when sentences are combined. So, nos está diciendo esta información que básicamente, verdad, una cláusula relativa es eh, una cláusula dependiente. Estas cláusulas, porque no son oraciones completas, esas cláusulas tienen un sujeto y un verbo pero no pueden funcionar como oración ellas solas. Eh, siempre, eh, o oh, se les llama eh, cláusulas de los adjetivos, porque funciona como un adjetivo. Da más información acerca del nombre y una cláusula relativa siempre comienza con un pronombre relativo que sustituye al nombre a una frase o un pronombre cuando la oración está combinada. So, the information that we have is this one.
Okay, so we have some elements that we need to know, um, or we are going to see in a separate space. So the first thing that we are going to uh, know are the relative pronouns. In this case, we are not going to use the normal pronouns that we already know, that are I, uh, he, she, it, we, you, and they. We are not going to use those pronouns. We are going to use the relative pronouns and we are going to see what are the relative pronouns, um, in which cases we are going to use those relative pronouns and obviously the uses for them. So we are going to have a, a table in which we are going to write the information about the pronouns that we are going to use in this situation. And we have six spaces and we have here the pronoun. Here we have the stands for. And we have the uses. So we have the first pronoun that is who. And it stands for people. And what is the use of this a pronoun? It says substitutes for subject, nouns, pronouns, he, she, we, and they. Then we have the second one that is whom. Whom stands for people also. And it says substitutes for object nouns or pronouns like him, her, us, and them. Then we have the third one and that is who. And it stands for people or things. Then we have the use and it says substitutes for possessive nouns or pronouns like his, hers, ours, or theirs. Then we have number four, and it that that stands for people or things. And we have here can be used for either subject or object. And also, 
can only be used in restrictive relative sources. But we are going to see what are the uh, restrictive relative clauses later. And then we have the last a pronoun that we have, that is which. And it stands for things. And it says, can be used for either subject or object. It also said, can be used in non-destructive relative clauses. And also said, can also be used in restrictive relative clauses so some people don't like this use. So in this case, it is not like very common to use which in a restrictive relative clauses because people don't uh, like to do that thing. But it is information that we have about this uh, pronoun. So we're going to see how can we use those pronouns in sentences, because we know that we have a different words for the uh, relative uh, pronouns that are who, whom, whose, that, and which. So how can we use those pronouns? Because when we are using the normal pronouns that are e, I, uh, you, he, she, it, we know that it's very simple to use they uh, pronounce in a sentence but in this case how can we create this sentence and remember we are using a uh, this a uh, pronoun with a relative clause vamos a utilizar estos pronombres con las cláusulas no en una oración completa son parte de una cláusula así que no va normalmente como lo hacemos con los otros tipos de pronombres. So we are going to have some examples in which we are going to see how can we create this or how can we use this or uh, pronouns uh, in uh, some sentences. So, so we are going to have uh, one example with a common uh, noun and then we are going to have um, an example using the pronoun. So we have first the example. Let's see. This one. And it says, I like the person. I like the person. And we have a period and it says, the person was nice to me. So in this case, the subject that we have for this is the person. So we are going to mark with uh, orange uh, the subject for the following uh, sentence that we have in uh, the example. Then it says, I like the person who, I like the person who 
was nice to me. I like the person who was nice to me. So in that case, we are not using the person as our uh, subject. In that case, we are using who that represents the person that was really nice to us. Then we have another one that is a kind of ugly uh, sentence. It is an example. I hate the dog. The dog bite me. The dog bite me. And in that case, the subject for that sentence is the dog. And now we are going to transform that sentence using a, a relative pronoun. And we have, I hate the dog that beat me. And we have the uh, pronoun that. Next one, I am moving to Louisville, KEA. It is home to Muhammad Ali Muslim. So in this case, it is our subject. So in this case, we change it, it for which. So in this case, when we are creating this kind of sentence, we can use the relative uh, pronouns as the subject of the sentence, but also we can use um, some of these uh, pronouns as the object of the sentence. So, in, in este caso, podemos utilizar eh, algunos de estos eh, sujetos or these uh, pronouns, I mean, eh, como el sujeto de la oración, o también tenemos algunos que se pueden utilizar como el objeto de la oración. Así que vamos a tener dos ejemplos que representen el objeto. So in this case, I'm going to write here subject of the sentence. And in the next one, I will write object of the sentence. And we have two examples. And it says, I like the bike. My father 
gave me the right. So in that case, the object is the bike. And we have the other example, and it says, I like the bike that my father gave me. And now we are going to talk about the restrictive relative clause that was mentioned on the table in which we were talking about the pronouns. So we are going to know what are these restrictive relative clauses. So it says that the restrictive relative clauses give information that defines the noun, information that is necessary for complete identification of the noun, use that or which for non-human nouns, use that or who for human nouns, and do not use commas. So in this case, it's saying that we're going to use that or which for non-human nouns. So in this case, it is not necessary to use a commas for separating the clauses. So we have here this example in, in which we can read. I like the paintings. And it says, which paintings? We can clearly identify them without the relative clause. Cuando estamos utilizando este tipo de oraciones, por eso es que utilizamos las relative clauses, eh, porque nos está dando más información acerca del de nombre, ¿verdad? En esa, en esa oración solo dice, me gustan las pinturas. Pero ¿cuál es pintura? No tenemos más información acerca de las pinturas de las que esta persona está hablando. 
En este caso necesitamos agregarle más información para que sea eh, más específico. And we have like we can eh, add some information like this. The painting hung in the CABS North Lobby. And we can use the same sentence to create the uh, clothes. I like the paintings. That is one clothes. That is um, that is a link with the word that hangs in the S A S D North Lobby. So we are uh, making a connection uh, with one clause to the other by the uh, pronoun that. En este caso estamos utilizando that como la unión de dos eh, cláusulas que nos van a dar más información acerca de la primera idea que estamos dando. También tenemos otra opción de cómo podemos... Tome. Sorry, if you use which, it's correct too. With. Yeah. In that case, no, because uh, we are not using that um, that pronoun. We have the the list here. We have who, whom, who, that, and which. And in this case, we are using uh, that, and we are using a uh, which for non-human. But in this case, we are going to see uh, the example with which, that is uh, the word that we are going to use for this. Um, it says that when we are using which, is acceptable, but some people, um, like they don't really like to use which with that uh, sentence. Es eh, más que todo, ¿verdad? Preferencia. Se puede utilizar which, pero no a todos les gusta utilizarlo. Prefieren más el that para hacer la conexión. Así que es como no muy común, pero sí podemos llegar a utilizarlo, pero no abusar de ello. Así que en algunos casos sí pueden utilizar which, pero no todos lo utilizan de esa manera. No, no, no les gusta mucho. So, podemos decir también, um, I like the paintings which hang in the S A S B North Lobby. Se acepta esta esta oración. Sí, se puede aceptar, pero no a todos les gusta utilizarla. So it's depending on how can you use that word. Sí lo pueden utilizar, pero no todo el mundo eh, lo utiliza. In that case, they prefer to use that for that kind of eh, sentences. Thank you. You're welcome. So it says, when the noun is the object, of the preposition, both the noun and the preposition move together to the front of the relative clause. In less formal English, it's common to move only the pronoun for to the front of the clause. Cuando tenemos eh, el nombre es el objeto de la preposición, 
tanto el nombre como la preposición se mueven juntos, ¿verdad? Al principio de la cláusula relativa. En algunos casos, ¿verdad? Cuando se utiliza un inglés eh, formal, es muy común eh, que nosotros movamos solo el pronombre al principio de la cláusula. So we have the temple. And it says, I spend hours talking with a person last night. I hope to hear from her and then we can change that and we say I hope I hear from the person with whom I spend hours talking last night. In this case, we are using a more formal uh, way to say it. So we have a um, um some information more about the relative clauses but we are going to end this topic on the next um session and that is on monday so we are going to end the session here and we are going to see each other on monday so have a really good night and have a really good weekend teacher tell me Sorry, I have the last question. Where, where I find, can I find this document? I sent the link to the group. I don't know if you have access to the link. If not, I'm going to send the link again uh, tonight. Please, thank you. You're welcome. Good night. Good night. See you Monday. See you Monday. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank Good you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night.